name is Seth. I'm going to be giving a talk on breaking down the web of trust. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about trust metrics used in OpenPGP, uh, why there are a lot of good key signing practices out there, and why, or you know, unfortunately, why most people don't seem to follow them, and all the problems that PKI has as a result, and try to get people to see good key signing practices, hopefully apply it to the key signing party immediately afterwards here, and hopefully use it to strengthen the web of trust in general in the future. So if I'm going too fast or if I'm speaking in a way that's hard to understand, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and try to get me to stop. Also, if you have a question at any time, uh, don't hesitate to get my attention, even if you have to shout or throw something at me to, to get me to notice. <laughs> Just, just get my attention and say, hey, I've got a question, hey, I don't understand, and I'll do my best to explain it for you. So before we begin the full talk, I would like to ask, how many people here use PGP or GPG or something of the sort? Excellent. How many people are going to the key signing party afterwards? Cool. Why aren't you all going? Seriously, like you should stick around, at least try to get some signatures, it's always good. But here's a key. You don't have to attend to get signatures. I don't know who was doing that last year, but that's, that's really not good. Um, so here's, huh? I don't know who has it. I've got mine. You guys have yours somewhere. Um, so here's a key. Here is the information for a public key. Who here would sign this key, given the opportunity? All right, I have one person in the entire room who would sign this key. Why would you do it? Even though the name on the key has numbers in it? Yes, absolutely. If I know him as Ultra Laser, then I would more than happily sign his key as such. Okay, who thinks this guy is full of it? All right, can, can I see a show of hands? Who thinks like this guy is completely wrong? What did he say? Could you repeat it? He said that if he knew the person as Ultra Laser, he would sign the key, even if like he didn't have a photo ID showing that the guy's name was Ultra Laser. <coughs> No, nobody wants to take the other, the other viewpoint? No? Okay, well, this is something to think about over the course of the talk. This is one of the things I'm going to mention. But keep this key in mind because it's a very good example and situations like this have actually come up recently at key signing parties I've attended. And I guess what would you need to know before you did? Um, you know, the, he mentioned, you know, if this guy is known as Ultra Laser, but, you know, who would want to see a photo ID with Ultra Laser on it? You would, you, would, you, would trust, you would trust a photo ID if it had that as the name on it? Adam Smasher! I'm, that's his legal name. All right. So I want to start off by talking about the web of trust. And why is it that we need a web of trust? Um, so my key, that's the key ID at the top. And these are some key IDs of people that I know and I've verified and I've signed. But the point of the web of trust is to be able to tr believe that a key is valid and that a key is, it belongs to who they say it belongs to, even if you've never met the person before. This is a very interesting problem. Uh, the biggest problem with public key cryptography is the PKI problems involved. Uh, it's easy to do the cryptography. The protocols for having it be trustworthy are difficult. So anybody can run through the RSA algorithm or Elgamal or whatever and encrypt something, but encryption is absolutely worthless if you're not sure that the person that you're encrypting to is the person that you really want to, to get the message. So if I want to send a message to you and I'm really encrypting to her, then the encryption is worse than worthless because I think I'm safe and I'm really not. So you want to make sure that the, the, the goal is to have nobody else able to read your message, the goal is not to just encrypt the message. Encryption isn't the solution. You have to use it properly in order for it to satisfy your needs. So the whole point is to trust the validity of keys you've never seen before. And to do this, there are a number of different components, and trusting other people's ability to make good decisions is one of them. 
And as we all know from a day-to-day -day basis, or I, we probably all know from a day-to-day -day basis, trusting other people even for the most simplest of things is a non-trivial task. So here's an example web of trust. Um, I'm not sure whose this is. I just grabbed an image because I didn't have Graphiz installed at the time of doing my slides. But each of these circles belongs to a person and it refers to their key. And you can view the web of trust as a graph. In the graph theory sense, not in the general mathematics line going everywhere sense. Uh, you have vertices, which in this case are people's keys and you have edges between the vertices, which are signatures. And each signature is a directed arrow. So you can see on this graph that the arrows are not two ways. You can have a non-mutual signature set uh, between different keys. So I can sign your key, but that doesn't mean that you've signed my key. And this is perfectly acceptable, and it's pretty common because a lot of people go to key signing parties and say they're going to sign everybody key, everybody's keys, and then they don't. So this happens, it's not a bad thing, it's just something you have to keep into consideration when looking at signature lists and trying to calculate trust metrics. At the bottom, there's an example of what it looks like as output from GPG. So it lists the user ID that I have on my key. It's got my name and my email address in it. And here are a couple of example signatures. Two of them I actually got from the key signing party here last year. It also has names and email addresses in them. And by these people having signed my key, it means that they trust the key and they trust my identity. So that means both my name and they've checked photo ID of mine and my email address where they've sent the key to my email address so that they know the email address is working if I end up getting the signatures uploaded to a key server. Yes? Uh, is it a good idea to um, um, say I trust this email address because uh, the security of an email address, POP or SMTP to pay IMAP, is uh, more or less nothing? Is it a good idea to say I trust this email address? Isn't it enough to say I trust the name? Personal preference. Um, the security on a lot of email addresses is crap, but there's no way to easily prove this. Um, if somebody else has sniffed a password and can read their email address or their emails, it doesn't really benefit them to grab the signature and upload it to the key server if everything else still checks out. Uh, one of the problems here, and you've, you've just noticed this, that I'm going to get into is that the name and the email address are inseparable. Uh, if you want to verify one, you have to also show that you trust the other. There's no way to say I trust the name or the email address. There's no way to say I trust this range of bytes in the UID. It's all or nothing. And this is a problem that I'm going to get into a little bit later. So yes, that is, that is a problem. Um, one thing about the web of trust is everybody calls it the web of trust, but there's actually two different aspects to it. There's the web of trust and what I like to call the web of validation. When you sign somebody's key, you are not saying that you trust their judgment, you are saying that you trust that the key belongs to them. So signing a key validates the key. You are saying, I think that it is okay to use this key, and I think that the person is who they claim to be on the key, and I believe that the cryptographic material in the key is accurate, and it hasn't been changed in transit, there's been no man in the middle attack. You are saying, I think this key is trustworthy for me to use, and that's all you're saying. There's a second part that a lot of people seem to forget, and that second part is the actual web of trust. You're not saying, I trust this key. You're saying, I trust the owner of this key to make introductions for me. So if I were to sign your key, then I'm saying your key is valid, and I will use it to communicate with you. But then I have to set an additional parameter saying, I don't trust your introductions, or I do trust your introductions completely, or I only trust them partially. And that's the second step that lets you trust the key of somebody you haven't met that you don't know at all. And a lot of people completely miss this step, even though it is the most critical step in the web of trust, because without it, you wouldn't be able to trust anybody beyond one hop. 
So a signed key is validated. An unsigned key may or may not be trusted based on whether you trust people who have signed that key. So to build that web of trust, in GPG, you use the command update trustDB, and it will run through your key ring, and it will look for any keys that you've signed, and it will ask you whether you trust that person to sign other keys. So in this case, it sees that there's a key that I have not assigned a trust value to. Uh, in GPG, there's a trustDB file. It is completely separate from the key ring that handles all of the trust yeah. values. Nobody else ever sees these values. So you can say, I don't trust this person, and you don't need to worry about it getting back to them because it's used for you only. It's all personal, and this is potentially sensitive information that somebody else can get upset if you, know, you happen to say to somebody, I don't trust you. They might say, okay, well then, even though I should, I don't trust you anymore, and everything breaks down very quickly. So this is very personal information. It never goes anywhere else. You shouldn't feel ashamed to say, I do not trust this person's judgment. If you have any doubts at all, you should say, I don't trust them. Err on the side of caution. So then there are different levels of validity or trust that you can assign to the key. Um, the default is, I don't know. And in this case, the key will not be used in building your personal web of trust. You can say, I don't trust it, in which case this person's signature on another person's key will be worthless. Then you can say, I trust it marginally or I trust it fully. If you trust it fully, any key that is signed by this key will automatically be good. If you say you trust it marginally, then there is a user-defined threshold of how many marginals you need in order to have something be valid. So in most default cases, this is three. So you need three marginal signatures or marginal trust values for it to be a good key. You can customize this. You can say, well, two is good enough. You can say 10 is good enough. But it's completely up to you. And as an example of validity versus trust, here's the key of a friend of mine from back home. Um, she's laughing because she knows exactly who I'm talking about. but. His key is valid. I would use his key to send him an encrypted message because I know for a fact he is who he claims to be, both his name and his handle and his email address. And I know that the key material in his key is correct. However, the guy has no idea what he's doing with cryptography. He has no clue. He's the kind of person that should not be using cryptography. <laughs> and if he signs somebody else's key, I, that means nothing to me. So I trust his key to send messages to him. I do not trust signatures from his key on other people for me to trust other people's keys. So this is the difference between validity and trust. His key is valid, but he is never trusted. <laughs> Everybody with me so far? Excellent. OK, so that's the quick and dirty introduction to the web of trust. Almost everybody here says that they use this system, so I try not to stick on it for too long because I'm sure you already know all this. But let's get into the interesting things now. The goals of the web of trust are to verify that a key is accurate. And to do this, you check the fingerprint. So you want to make sure that there has not been a man in the middle attack, somebody else putting different keys into a key exchange so that if Alice sends a message, it's really encrypted to Mallory. Mallory decrypts it, re-encrypts it, sends it to Bob, and then vice versa on the way back. Uh, you want to make sure that the person who owns the key is saying, this is really my key. Not any other key, just this one. You also want to make sure that the key ownership is accurate. So you want to make sure that the name on the key is really the person who they claim to be. So if my key had the name of you know, George Bush on it. Even if I said, well, this is the right fingerprint on the key, somebody shouldn't sign it because I'm claiming to be somebody different than who I really am. And, you know, I certainly hope nobody would mistake me for him, but um, you, you want to make sure that the data is going to who you want it to go to and only who you want to go, who you want it to go to can read it. So you check the name against a photo ID or against a reputation-based system if you're feeling kind of adventurous, 
and you check the email address by making sure that the signature actually gets to that email address before it gets to a key server. But this, these two goals are really just subsets of the primary goal, and that is to verify the key identity binding. Yes? Well, I haven't got why to check um, the email address. What would be the attack to this, um, well, set if I don't check the email address? Uh, if you don't check it, I'm sorry, what? Well, yeah, why should it check the email address? Because it's like any other bit of information that you're putting on a user ID. It, it has nothing to do specifically with email address. It can be anything. So if you put your phone number in a user ID, I would not want to sign the user ID unless I had called you at that phone number and knew that it was your phone. Uh, you could put in like a web page in a user ID if you wanted, and I wouldn't want to sign the user ID unless I knew the web page was yours. When you sign a user ID, well, when you sign a key, you're not actually signing the key, you're signing a user ID. You can't sign a key without signing a user ID. You can sign multiple user IDs, but you have to sign at least one. And when you sign it, you're verif you're, you are stating to the world, I think this information is accurate. And if you trust me, then you'll trust this. And you wouldn't want to sign something if it was incorrect. So if I put down my email address as billgates at microsoft.com, would you want to put your signature on it saying, this is a valid email address. If you trust me, trust it. And then you know, somebody says, well, that guy's not Bill Gates. You just made a bad decision. I don't trust you anymore. Got somebody back there. Um, you said uh, somebody can say you're not um, reachable under uh, Bill Gates at Microsoft.com, but I saw hundreds of keys which are, um, I say, um, me at gmx.de. And today I'm reachable under this email address, but my signature um, is there for the next 10 years, and I, uh, I don't know if this email um, is him tomorrow. Well, if you change your email address, if, if I say I used to be Bill Gates at Microsoft.com, and then I say, you know, I might as well give the real guy his real email address, you know, because I feel nice. What I should do is I should revoke the user ID. Yeah, but I can't control it. Uh, you, you can't. But if you, if you can't verify it, then you shouldn't assert that it's true. And it, it might be out of your control, but you shouldn't have to worry about saying, I will not sign this because I don't believe it. It might be out of your control, but it's still ultimately your choice whether you put the stamp of approval on it or not. And if you have any doubts at all, you shouldn't do it. And that should be seen as their loss, not your loss. So. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to, to, to comment uh, on previous question. Uh, in a certain sense, uh, the email is what counts the most. Because uh, if we use it, that uh, for email, uh, the automatic se selection of which key will be used to encrypt the email uh, without asking you any further uh, question happens on the email address and not uh, on the name of the other person. If you look at systems like FOF, friend of a friend, they use the email address as the unique identifier for a person because in theory only one person is going to be on the other end of an email address. Uh, you know, I'm not assuming a list or whatever, but it's a unique identifier. It's as good as any other unique identifier, which is semi-unique. But it's, it's something that can be fairly easy verified. And because most people are using GPG to do communication online, it seems a very good point to, to consider as you know, a, a very important thing to verify. Did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, why should governments be trusted to issue identity for the purposes of this more than personal knowledge? I'm, I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Okay. I think, did, did you still have something? Okay. Okay, I'll get to that in a little bit. But before I continue, let me just point out that user IDs are for human convenience only. 
you can put absolute and total garbage in there and tell everybody, my user ID has garbage in it. I don't want you to verify that. I just want you to verify the key material only. And this is acceptable. I mean, it's, you can't verify a key without verifying a user ID just by the way the system works. And if you don't want to be known by any contact information at all, one thing you might want to do is put a photo ID in there as your primary user ID. If you, know, you don't want to give out even a pseudonym, you can just say, well, you're going to see my face anyways if we meet in person. Or maybe you want to put a voice recording as your primary user ID and somebody can listen to your voice recording and listen to you on the phone and say, well, I think the voices are the same. It's just a matter of convenience. It's a way of doing this key to identity binding. And when you sign a key, you're actually stating not only is the key good, but I believe the key belongs to the person I believe it belongs to. And that's the most important part in building the web of trust. And as for that key identity binding, you know, again, signatures are on user IDs. You always have to check the fingerprint because there's no way around it. It's just something that always needs to happen whether you sign one user ID or you sign all of them. You need to check the fingerprint before you do it. And each user ID should be signed separately. So if somebody has five different email addresses on their key, then you should sign each one individually and send each signature to each respective email address, which is a real pain in the ass, but somebody wrote a nice Perl script to do it for you automatically. So there's no reason not to. And if you verify one user ID, then you know, you're saying the key is good. A lot of people will say, well, if the key is good, then I might as well verify all of them, but you're still putting in the potential for bad information that somebody may sign blindly. And this is a mistake. You should never sign anything, UIDs included, unless you know 100% for sure that you believe that this is legitimate. So sign each one individually and resist the urge to say yes when it asks you if you want to sign everything at once. So again, I said this talk was prompted by some recent events at some key signing parties. I was at the DEF CON key signing party back in July, and there were four people there, including me, which was pretty pathetic. And one guy, I'd already signed his key, he'd already signed mine, and the other two people there presented pseudonyms. They gave their handles. They did not give their real names, and both of them did not want to show real photo ID. I was okay with this, but the other guy, he, he was furious. He thought they were making a fun of the, whole, of the whole process. He thought that they were fucking everything up and that, you know, how dare you do this if you don't know what you're doing. So, you know, one thing that he said is, I never sign a key that doesn't have a real name on it. There's no way to verify a handle. Does anybody agree with this? What do we do? Does anybody disagree with yeah. this? Yes, absolutely. So, can somebody tell me who this guy is? Sir who, who said Jeff Moss? Okay. How do you know his name is Jeff Moss? I'm sorry? You, you've met him. Have you seen his photo ID? No, I, neither have I. But I, I, I would sign a key that has this person. If I knew this person gave me a key and the name was Jeff Moss on it, I would not need to see photo ID. Does anybody here disagree with that? I'm sure somebody does. No? OK. Well, the reason is if everybody else in a very large event knows this guy is Jeff Moss, it doesn't matter what name is on his photo ID. It doesn't. Because if somebody says Jeff Moss, well, in this community, in this context, this is the guy you'll probably think about. And whether his name is that or not, whether you know if he was born as something completely different and just goes by it as a pseudo pseudonym and it's not his real legal name on all of his documents it doesn't matter because you're just doing the key to identity binding and the identity isn't the name it's a completely abstract concept and you know it's this guy whether it's his real name or not what about this guy does anybody know who this guy is somebody give me this guy's name that's not his name yep Eric Corley, but you know, if I said Emmanuel Goldstein, not the guy from the book, who would you think about? You know, 
Which one's the real thing? Anybody? Anybody? If I said a manual, who would you think about? You know, if you were talking to a manual at 2600.com online, which one of these two guys do you think you would be talking to? What's the email address? <laughs> a manual at 2600.com. So which one's the real thing? You don't need to know the real name. You don't need to even know the handle completely in order to verify the keto identity binding. Because a manual at 2600.com is a lot more likely to be that weird guy than that weird guy. It, it's just the way it works. And people know this not from checking photo IDs or verifying email addresses, but just having a decent amount of research into the social network that builds the community. And that's the important part. And a lot of people don't seem to believe this. So another common objection is a person only has one unique identity. You know, if I, I, last year at the key signing party here, a couple of people were kind of upset with me that I had a number of different keys on the list. In fact, I think I kind of overdid it and had uh, four keys on the list. Four. I, I had a DSA key and an RSA key for my personal email address, and I've since revoked the RSA key. I had one for a different project I was working on, and I had one for my work. This year I had two keys, my personal one and my work key. And people have said, this is too much. You know, why not just have two different user IDs on one key? And my response has been, these are two different identities. These are two different aspects of myself that I would like to keep separate. And just because I'm not using a handle for one and a real name for another doesn't mean they're not two different aspects of my identity that should be kept separate. So what happens if you go by a pseudonym? Let's start off pretty easy. So in the hacker community, you go by a pseudonym, and you don't want that to be associated with your real name at work. Because you know, if your boss at work found out that you were acidburn at hackers.com, you might get fired. So you have two different keys. And who'd sign this key? Would anybody here sign this key? Let's assume she's a real person. Who here would sign this key? Yes. So I've heard. So, I, so I've heard. Um, who wouldn't? That's not the whole room. Come on, guys. OK. Why wouldn't you do it? Anybody? Why wouldn't you do it? You don't know her, but she's in a movie that millions of people worldwide have seen. How can you argue that? <laughs> that that's fair. That's fair. How, how, it, it's not a matter of. You know, you look at her ID and it says acid burn on it or whatever, but enough people know somebody by name, then why isn't it good enough? You know, what if it was slightly different? Would you sign this key? What, what if this person in this movie or this real, fake, real person identified herself as Angelina Jolie? Would you sign her key? Who, who here would sign it? Why? Okay, if, if you didn't see your passport. But what if you saw her name in the credits of the movie? I, I'm not, if I'm doing GPG key signing, I'm mm -hmm. not doing filmography key signing. So I don't care about what she did in the movie okay. or these many movies. If I saw a passport that looked good to me as in not fake, which I don't really know, of course. But if I saw a passport with a picture that looked at, like her in any of these movies, and then okay. I would, of course. OK, well, under the same token, what about this? You know. Is this any different? What if, what if this was the picture associated with the key as opposed to this? Would, would you have any different thoughts on signing this key if it was that? You should have seen uh, many Debian developers' passports. You would sign Does anybody not believe that her name is Angelina Jolie? Does anybody here doubt that? Why? But does it matter? If enough other, if I were to be like, yeah, man, you know, I was dreaming the other night, and I, I completely, I'd totally bang that Angelina Jolie actress chick. Do you, do you, do you think I'd be talking about her, or do you think I'd be talking about like, you know, that that weird Emmanuel Goldstein guy? Like, who do you think I'd be talking about? 
<laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, it, uh, <clears throat> I would say if many other p p people know her as uh, Angelina Jolie, let this many other people sign her key as Angelina <laughs> Jolie. Uh, the, 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 uh, the fact okay. that the other people know her under a name uh, 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 doesn't make me sign um, her key under okay. that name. It, it has me to, 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 uh, to, to know her as, uh, uh, under that name. Fair enough. Sounds good. Okay, so nobody would sign her key because I guess you know nobody's banging her, so you don't know that she's really who she says she is, and that, that's okay. Here's a serious example. <coughs> Does anybody know who security-officer at netbsd.org is? Who is it? Is, it? is it one person? Is it a team of people? Who, who is it? It's a team of people. Okay. What, what, what are their names? Do you know their names? Well, not from my head, but I can just uh, check it out. Does it matter? Well, yeah. If people are signing their keys saying, I know this, this key is security-officer at netbsd.org, how do you know that if it's not even a real person? Well, I mean... She's not a real person, and nobody here would sign her key for that reason. So why does it matter if you know she she looks like that, or if she looks like he they look like that? You know what's what's the difference? It's a role. You're signing an email only. Okay. Yes, you're signing an email only. But how do you know if one person within the role or the group? you know, say, takes a signature and doesn't tell anybody else about it, how do you know that there's internal consistency within the group? How do you know there's even a group? How can you verify an identity, even if it's an email address, if you're not sure as to whether the verification process is correct? By sharing uh, that um, address, uh, they took the risk. I mean, it's, uh, it's outside of my control. Okay, but you'd still, if it's outside of your control, you'd still put your signature on it? And I'm not saying um, it's a bad thing. I'm just asking you. OK. Um, someone who, who has control of that email um, uh, um, 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 got it. OK. Was there somebody else? Um, or somebody over here? Uh, this guy. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I wouldn't sign it. Um, I think it works uh, the other way around. I mean, the people working as security office sign this role key, and those identities I can prove. So mm -hmm. I would sign those keys, and they would again sign yes. the role key. So no problem at all. I agree with you completely, and that's what I would do. But this key has 24 signatures on it. Security-officer at netbsd.org has signed three other keys. So does that mean the entire team has verified the information, one person in the team? Is, how many people are in the team? Is it two people? Is it 100 people? I don't know, but the team as a whole publicly asserts that they have signed and verified three other keys. They have a mean shortest distance of 4.6, which is pretty decent. I mean, it's not horrible, but they're, they're well connected within the web of trust. They're ranking 2,750 out of about 30,000, and they're only three hops from my key. In fact, there are three hops by four different paths from my key. And this guy, the, the second hop guy, is the one who said that he won't sign <coughs> pseudonyms. So, I mean, I might disagree with the guy's policy, but I know that I will trust anything that he signs because the guy is more serious about it, more strict about it, rather, than I am. So, um, Short, uh, a more extreme example is the Heise crypto company key, which uh, has a lot of signature on it. And there you don't even have uh, a, a team. You know this is uh, the, the Heise uh, firm, but uh, you don't, don't have any people behind it. Hmm. What do you mean you don't have any people behind it? Uh, um, for me, this, this key is... Um, a very abstract uh, identity. Uh, it's, for me, it is not connected to, to any people, but uh, only uh, like, uh, um, like a um, CA for, for SSL. It okay. is, is, this is an I, um, identity that gives out, um, that has a policy that gives 
out um, certifications to other people, but not the other way around. Okay. Um, I can give you another example of something like that. Uh, CA Cert, who's here, has a bot that will do it if you verify through some other means. And while I don't disagree with this, uh, a lot of people have reciprocated by signing the, the bot's key. And it's not even a real person. It's just an automated program, and they're still signing a key. You know, if you know that this program has really been written and run by them and has no weird back doors, then sure. But I haven't seen the source code, and I don't know how it works. But people still sign it. Uh, but uh, how is the CA prints uh, fingerprint in their um, magazine? So you got a fingerprint, but in CR cert you don't even get one. Well, so does this guy. I mean, he printed his fingerprint in, you know, the the DefCon magazine, and a lot of people didn't do any further research and signed it. And to some people, this is good enough. But to other people, it's not. Where do you draw the line? I'm not saying I disagree with you. It's just there's no way of quantifying the level of trust involved. And with different people, there's different levels of trust, and there's no way of specifying this. In nearly every country in the world, a corporation is entitled to a legal identity of its own. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any problem with a key belonging to a corporation in its own name. That's a very good and point. procedures exist in most, most countries um, to, verify, to establish who is behind the corporation. Right, but at the, the end of the day, yeah, there are legal ways of saying, you know, if the company gets sued and because they did something blatantly illegal, somebody's going to go to jail for it. And there's still a chain of responsibility, you know, whether it's the board of directors or each individual shareholder, there's still a way of tracing back that responsibility. And with a corporation, it's public. So you can do your research and find out who the people involved are, but how do I know that NetBSD, NetBSD has decided to update their web page recently and the people listed as security dash officer, and I don't think I was able to get this information off their web page. How do I know that they're the people who really represent this key? Is NetBSD a corporation? Uh, I do believe it is. Uh, I'm a bit hesitant when it comes to company keys because my, maybe I know this company. I know the guys working there. I trust them. I signed their company key. The next day, some evil rich man buys the company, fires every one of them, and puts some untrusted team behind that key. And according to lo the law, that old team has to give that secret key to the new team because they don't have to. They, they could revoke the key and say, not make legally. Your own. Not legally. They own the designs. It would be a, an illegal act if they revoked the key when they own the If the, if the person, it. if the person whose job description was to administer such things was fired, it would be proper operating procedure to revoke the key and tell the incoming new person to generate a new one. Not according to the laws in, in my country. Really? So I've, well, what, and what country? Anyway. I'm from Sweden. Okay. It would probably be illegal act to revoke that really? key if hmm. the owner says you're not supposed to, uh, to revoke okay. it. So, well, so, 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 so signing a company key means for me, I'm signing something into the future that I don't know if it's valid tomorrow. And that's a bit scary, I think. I, I, yes, that, that is. I find that very interesting and very scary as well. So I wouldn't want to be in that position. Can revoke signatures? You can, you can yeah, yeah. Do, do people do it? No. Do people revoke IDs? Yeah. You guys do, but do people in general? And unfortunately, the answer to that is uh, That's true. All right, one more thing, and then we got to move on because we're running out of time. So, um, uh, If the identity on, on the key uh, you are signing is the one of the company, if the company uh, gets bought out, I mean, uh, it's not the person's identity that you sign, it's the company. Um, so it follows. The, uh, the, um, the, 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 the buyout. Okay. All right, so here's another thing I've heard at these key signing parties. You can always trust a photo ID. Can somebody tell me what is wrong with this photo ID? I'm not even talking about that. I, I'm talking about this this license right here. Okay, look, 
Okay, so when this license expires, she's no longer this person. Like, I, I've been turned down at bars from buying drinks because my driver's license has been expired. So, you know, I was, you know, older than 21 a week ago, but I'm not anymore. So maybe I'm not 21 anymore. But there's something very obviously wrong with this ID. Can somebody tell me what it is? This guy in the back. Okay, well, let's just say this is what a South Carolina driver's license looks like. It's a little more obvious than that. Can, <laughs> can anybody at all? What about her last name? Yes. Yes, okay. Her, her name really is Sarah Lane. I, I found this, this woman by just doing a Google Images search for fake ID, and she posted in her blog, this fake ID was great, even though they obviously fucked up my last name and abbreviated it like a street. It still let me buy liquor for three years. Her last name is Lane. Her, the signature is Sarah Lane. And somebody was like, oh yeah, Lane is a street, so LN period, Lane. <laughs> but other than that, this looks exactly like a South Carolina driver's license. I, mean, I, I had a friend who was from Maine, and Maine is one of those out of the way places, which is the nice way of saying it. But he had a uh, driver's license from the early 90s. It was a piece of paper that was filled in with typewriter, and it was very badly laminated. Nobody would ever let him buy alcohol using this ID as a proof of his age because they'd look at it and they'd laugh and be like, come on, you can do better than that. <laughs> but the funny part is, it was a 100% legitimate photo ID. But it looked like shit, so nobody took it. So how do you know what's real and what's not? And I mean, I have no idea what a Swedish driver's license looks like. No idea. How it had been... It had been expired long ago, in um, 1999. Yeah, the, the expiration... And so it has to be a very... I, I pulled this image off the web, so let's pretend the expiration date is 2010. <laughs> I, I'm working with what I got. I don't have any fake IDs. I actually don't have any, but... <laughs> Anyways, next slide. Um, okay, I never sign a key that doesn't have a real name. You can always verify a real name with photo ID. Let's pretend, you know... Fake IDs, they exist, but you can usually tell a bad ID from a good ID or whatever. Well, does anybody recognize this guy? <laughs> Again, Google Images search, fake ID, one of the first things that popped up. But this looks like a Virginia's driver's license and expired. <laughs> I guess people aren't posting new fake, li fake IDs to the web, sorry. <laughs> All right, can somebody, like, you know, does any, don't, if you do know who this is, don't say anything, but can somebody, does anybody here know who this is? If you do, raise your hand. Okay, the people who have seen this talk while I was working on it know who this is. Here's her driver's license. She lives in Maryland. Her name is Barbara Pierce. She lives at 160 Madison Avenue in Baltimore. And one common problem that a lot of people have with showing off their photo ID is that it gives out too much information. I don't like showing mine off because I had to walk for like half an hour through the rain on a very bad day, so I look really pissed off. My hair is like all froofy and everything. It's the most awful picture of me I've ever seen in my life. So when, when somebody sees my credit card and says check ID and they ask me for my ID, I apologize as I hand it to them because I don't want them to see that. But you know, it's there for a reason. A lot of people don't like showing off their IDs because, especially in the hacker scene, when people go by pseudonyms, they don't like giving out their personal information. I mean, I'm going by my real name, Seth Hardy, but I, I'm, okay, I'm okay with telling people where I live. I don't have a problem with that. A lot of people do. And I understand the reasons why people do have issues with that, and I understand why people don't want to show off these things. At the last year's key signing party, people would hold their thumb over their address and be like, I'm sorry, but I don't want to give out where I live. OK, I, it's not relevant because it's not a part of their user ID. And unless they had their address in their user ID, I don't care where they live. So Barbara Pierce probably doesn't want to show off her ID because 
it has a lot of personal details, and yes. Yeah, well, let's pretend that rotten.com URL doesn't exist. <laughs> so, nobody here knows who this is? Nobody? Well, um, yeah, so how about a picture of her and her father? <laughs> Did, does anybody recognize who that guy is? So can somebody tell me who that is? You've got a 50% chance of getting it right. Can somebody tell me who she is? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's one of the Bush twins. That, that's Barbara Bush. She, that, this is the photo ID that she was using to illegally buy beer and get into bars before she was 21. This is the president of America's daughter, her fake ID. And yeah, so how do you know? How do you know that some random piece of plastic that somebody flashes you is good? At some point, you have to trust something. And I, I don't know shit about fake IDs. I'm not a qualified expert to say this ID is real and this ID is not. And I, I would consider myself more of a professional than the guy that sells me liquor. But <laughs> people make these decisions all the time. And the insistence on verifying photo ID at, is, is completely arbitrary. It, it is just as good or as bad of a decision as, say, verifying somebody's identity by a social network by saying, hey, this is the guy that runs DEF CON. I think I know who that is. His key is all right. This is as arbitrary of a decision-making process as any other, but because it is backed up by a government and it's on a piece of shiny plastic, people seem to accept it more. And I have a problem with this. So. That's my primary rant about how people are handling the web of trust and doing identity verification. Here's a, a quick overview of a potential non-crypto application that I'm working on for using the web of trust. Here's a slightly different key. Instead of having my name, it just has an email address. And uh, there are two of them. Uh, both of these email addresses are valid. I never touch my Gmail account. Uh, the only reason I have a Gmail account is so when everybody else, when they were still rare, was going, I want one, I could say I have one and I never use it. You're a sucker. You know, <laughs> don't, don't use a web-based email service that the whole point of it is for people to sell you advertisements and to learn about your personal habits by doing data mining. And you can run your own mail server. It'll be more secure and more private. But they're both valid. Which do you think is better? The top, I have three signatures by people who I would consider personal friends. And at the bottom, I have three signatures by random people that I exchanged signatures with after last year's key signing party here. Which would you try to contact me at first if you knew the information about the people who made these signatures? The first one, because I uh, yeah, um, don't trust Gmail to handle the information, right? Okay. So they will, I um, doubt they will handle this in the way I want. They will, will store the metadata connected with this email. Mm -hmm. And this would be available to persons I don't want to know this. Okay. Well, say Gmail is taken out of the equation. Say instead of having email addresses in the UADs, I have phone numbers. So you left out two signatures that that are important, you left out your self-signatures. And those include the primary user ID. Let's pretend that all of the user IDs are self-signed because I'm a lazy asshole and I don't make revocation uh, for user IDs. Yeah, but still, one of those will be the primary user ID. That can change. And in fact, if we go back in the slides, I can show you the primary user ID of somebody in the comment field of his key. He says, this is my real email address because I couldn't change it, and I lost control over the primary, so use this one instead. And he couldn't revoke his, uh, the, the email address because of some craziness going on, and he just put it in his comment field saying, use this one, really. Uh, the first ID has more specific uh, um, information on the signatures. OK. Yep. Person here? The answer to your question is, if I know Hendrik Schultz, then I will use the second one. And if I know Miles Norden, I will use the first one. And if I don't know anyone on this list, then it's all meaningless to me anyway. Right. OK. 
But what if you know that I talk to Miles Norden on an, on an almost daily basis and that I've never talked to Henrik Schultz since last year's key signing party? Which one would you use? If I don't know Miles, then, then this is still useless you, to me. You don't need to know him, but let's just pretend that you know that I talk to him on a daily basis. Would that give you any weight in your decision? No. Okay. You don't know for sure, but chances are likely that the person that you talk to every day has a better idea of how to get in touch with you than the person that you talk to once and have never since talked to again. And this may not always be the case, but if you look at it from a probabilistic standpoint, it's, it's a lot more likely to work. So what if user IDs were not attached to keys? What if you were just signing the user IDs for the basis of verifying the information in the user IDs? You know, so let's forget about crypto, and let's just say I'm going to publish a list of my email addresses and my different names I go by and my websites and my phone numbers, and if you think that the information is valid, you sign it, and you let the rest of the world know that you think it's currently valid. So take your entire address book, whether it's from your phone or from your program like Outlook or whatever, and go through and just set trust levels to each of them and then sign the information to do the rigorous crypto part of it and then push it out and say use a system like FOF. So here's an example of you know, some XML that tells everybody else how to get in touch with me. And at the very bottom, I have a phone number. And I let everybody else know this, but a lot of times if people change their phone number, you know you don't know whether the number is still valid or if it's not. Uh, because I might just get lazy, I might change my phone number, I might completely forget that I have this published on the web, and I might not update it. But if somebody else calls me on a daily basis, you know, if like, you know, my girlfriend calls me every night to say goodnight, you know, she probably knows what my phone number is. But the person who I haven't talked to in six months, while they may have used to know what my phone number is, they might not know it anymore. So you can assign trust values to people based on how well they know somebody else and then pull in all of the information and try to get a idea of which contact info is probably more, more likely to be correct. So, so you assign trust values to people based on how good they keep information, in this case in the social networking sense. So if you know that somebody is meticulous or anal about how they keep their data, their data is probably good. But if somebody comes in and out of somebody else's life every six months to a year, their data might be out of date. So you can assign trust values and you can crunch the numbers, come up with a good metric, and have a program that will show you what is the most probable contact information. This would be a pretty valuable extension to FOF, and I'm kind of working on it. I have too much other stuff going on, so I'm not doing as much as I could be. but. It's a project I'm working on so that people can have a probabilistic way of identifying how to get in touch with somebody in a way that they can trust more. And it's all based on existing social networks. It's not arbitrary signatures. It's not you know, a bunch of people dressed mostly in black showing up at key signing parties and you know, talking about how great crypto is and damn the man. And it's about real real-world social networks that everybody in this room uses on a day-to-day -day basis, whether they realize it or not. And it's difficult because the trust values may, may be different from person to person, but it does work. Look at the success of, of systems like Friendster, or MySpace, or whatever. These use very similar systems, but they're just not putting numbers on it. And I'm just saying, put some numbers, add some rigor to it, and it could be a very valuable tool in order to keep track of people that you haven't seen in a while or don't keep in touch with on a regular basis. So that's it, really, except for one last rant, and this has to do with the key signing party that's coming up. So you no, know, who, who here again is in the key signing party? Who here has read the key signing party how-to? OK. <laughs> who here likes the key signing party how-to? <laughs> Who here does not like the key signing party how-to? 
This wasn't originally going to be in the talk, but I read this as I was preparing my slides, and I just can't pass up the opportunity to rant about it because, really, what the fuck? <laughs> it's important to note here that some people believe that keeping their public key secret adds an extra degree of security to their encrypted communications. I'm going to read the rest of this. When you disagree with me, like raise your hand or flip me off or something, but I'm just going to read, and at the point where you object, let me know. This is true, because a key server could be broken or compromised and return the incorrect public key when queried. Further, the key on a, on a given public key server may not be the most up-to-date version of the key. For example, additional signatures may have been added to the key which have not been propagated or uploaded to the key server. It is also true because the public key of a key pair is needed to carry out certain types of attacks against the public key crisp crypto systems which PGP uses. While many people expect with reasonably large key sizes that these attacks are so extremely unlikely to be successful that it does not matter if the public key is broadcast, keeping the public key secret does in fact strengthen the key pair. You're not raising your hands. Come on, guys. <laughs> who, who, here's no, who here knows what Kerkhoff's assumption is? G give me a show of hands. Kerkhoff? Can somebody tell me who Kerkhoff is and what his assumption is? Up here. Uh, 19th century German cryptographer said, never assume that the crypto system is secret. Always assume that the secret key is secret. Yes. So I said, OK, what he said was basically, the only thing that should be kept secret in the system is the secret, and in this case, it's the key. An attacker should have full knowledge of how the system works and of all of the public details, and it's secure if they still can't break it. Security through obscurity is not. Yeah, so basically it doesn't increase security by keeping the public information secure because that should not be additional help to an attacker. It should be secure whether they know it or not. Unfortunately, you know, in, in practical examples like, for example, the United States healthcare system, they're not allowed to give out their public keys because, oh my God, somebody might see it on a key server and try to hack us. And even though the crypto is safe, that's dangerous. So we can't do it. But <laughs> there is one problem with this. Uh, this traffic analysis. Oh. There is one problem with it, which, it, which is traffic analysis. Uh, I know that uh, certain agencies are collecting public keys and they are analyzing the traffic because when you send something encrypted and, and signed with PGP, then the uh, the traffic includes the information who sent it and, and who it was sent to. And this makes sure that the, the people who, who uh, sniff the traffic uh, know who is communicating with them. So that's uh, part of the problem there, yeah. And I think that's, that's the reason why, why uh, this, this how-to is written that way. Okay. Well, my, my basic point is giving up the public key does not really add or take away from the security. By Kerkhoff's assumption, you should be able to have the public key and it should still be secure no matter what. Information leaking, side channel attacks, data gathering, that's a completely separate issue. There are ways around that. But I, I just, I don't, I don't get it. That it's saying don't give out your public key because it means your, your key pair can be broken into more easily. And it's stuff like this that is basically propagating bad key management practice and just myths about what is safe and what isn't. And traffic analysis is one thing, but that's completely separate. I'm just saying, it, you know, somebody might get your public key and they might be able to use your public key to break your crypto system and get your private key. But for a very small fraction of the price, you know, I could spend a million dollars, $10 million on setting up a supercomputer network to turn your public key into your private key, or I could go to a Walmart, I could spend $10 on a pair of pliers and a blowtorch and get it out of you. 
which is the more cost effective, which is the more practical attack, giving up your public key does not reduce the security of your system. Or I could just buy your but, everybody yes. Price. Everybody does have a price, but you know what? $10 at a Walmart for a pair of pliers and a blowtorch <laughs> is cheaper than your price. <laughs> but what about data mining? You can uh, see social networks and so on uh, based on the signatures of your public key. If you're just communicating with one person, well, the signatures don't need to be public, but it, it's the, the giving up of your public key information does not decrease the security by yeah. Kirchhoff's assumption, and that's all I'm saying. And yeah. the way that's phrased makes it, makes it kind of questionable. So. In addition, um, you can turn off the um, key ID in the message. So you can still, um, and the attacker can still look at the public key and see uh, who, whose key signed whose key, but he can't identify what key was used to encrypt this message. So oh, it's entirely true. Yeah, not, not entirely true, but we're, we're, we're not even considering those classes of attacks here. I'm just talking about in terms of being able to break the system or not, not side channel attacks for information gathering or data mining, just in terms of can I take the public key and turn it into the private key. There's no real security benefit. And I'm, that's all I'm saying. And if you want to talk about other types of attacks or data mining or how to use your keys in a safe and responsible format, that's one thing. But saying don't give up your public key because then, oh my god, somebody can break into your system, it's kind of irresponsible. Uh, maybe one remark to that. Uh, if you're really paranoid, of course you have to assume uh, the algorithm is broken as well. Just you don't know it because half of yeah, mathematics and you shouldn't work be using NSA. PGP. So I of PGP course is assume the, key, uh, the algorithm is broken. Try to keep as much from the uh, prying eyes, and so I'm a little bit safer. If I assume, if you're that paranoid, you should be using one-time pads and distributing the keys yourself, and not using a computer because of you know trusted computing platforms and gremlins in the silicon and, you know, <laughs> there are so many, what I'm, all I'm saying is there are so many other more plausible and more likely points of failure, you shouldn't be worrying about this. And by worrying about this, you're just taking your attention away from where it really matters and you're, you're losing security overall. So let me just finish up with the conclusions and then we can talk a little more about this as we go into the key signing party. Current good key signing practice doesn't let us use pseudonyms, doesn't let us use organizations, companies, anything like that, and it doesn't let us use informal social networks, which we use on a day-to-day -day basis in order to, in, in order to have basic social interactions with other people. How many people here believe my name is actually Seth Hardy? Without having, without seeing a photo ID, how many people of you, how many people here care? Who cares? <laughs> Okay, like we, we have one guy in the whole room that cares. Whether I call myself Seth or whether I call myself Ultra Laser, it doesn't matter. As long as you know that I'm Ultra Laser, then the key is still valid. And it doesn't so much matter about the specifics of the name on the key as long as you're able to verify the identity binding. And the identity is me. It's this abstract concept. It's kind of like a bubble around me. You're like, hey, it's that guy that ranted for a while with a bottle of tequila in front of a few hundred people. You know, it's, it, it has nothing to do with my name, it has nothing to do with my photo ID, it doesn't even have anything to do with my email address unless you specifically want to email me. So right now we can't use any of these things. There are contradictions and blatantly wrong information in the official documentation and there are people who refuse to participate in key signing parties because people who want to go by pseudonyms will not show their IDs or will show their IDs, like, you know, I, I have a friend, he goes by Mangala. That's not his name, but that's what everybody knows him by. So, you know, why should he have to show his ID? What, why should he have to deal with people not signing his key because he doesn't want to show a photo ID because it's just not relevant? And things like this are damaging the web of trust and it's preventing it from having the same sort of social domination that, say, MySpace does. Everybody's using MySpace. I hate it, but everybody is using it. Everybody knows that it is a social network. MySpace.com, look it up for yourselves. It's not worth talking about, okay? <laughs> not worth talking about. <laughs> so there's just so many better ways of doing this, and people are actively blocking out large chunks of valid information by refusing to 
accept certain types of information that it can be verified, but just not by a piece of shiny plastic with a government seal on it. And in the end, you have to trust something, whether it's the government to issue legitimate IDs. You know, if somebody, you look at their ID and you're still not sure because you're like, well, this ID is kind of peeling on the corner. Is it really them? Do you, do you ask for the person's birth certificate? Do you go talk to the person's parents? Do you look at the person's parents and be like, well, your, your mom has your, your nose, so she gave you her nose. You're, you're, you have your dad's eyes, but I still don't know, you know if it was like your dad or the milkman because of you know, the features of his chin. Like, where, where do you draw the line? Where you have to trust something eventually. And there's always a way to attack it. You just have to decide, OK, this is good enough. It would be more feasible for somebody to come after me with a pair of pliers and a blowtorch than to try to fake things this way. So I'm going to trust it. It's good enough. Social reputations are more fault tolerant, but they don't have pieces of plastic with a shiny government seal on it. And people prefer one to the other, and I think this is wrong. And this is, whether you agree with this or not, that's your choice. It's just something to consider. So can you trust something you can't verify with your own two eyes? Maybe I'll keys the primary user ID. If you intend on talking to other people in person, it should be a photo ID and everything else is additional information. But you know, why, why don't you trust what you think you should trust, what you see with your own two eyes, what you think your judgment says this is good, rather than, well, the GPG key signing party how-to says I should do this, so I'm going to do it blindly without even thinking about it. So make your own decisions. Sign things that you think are accurate. Do your own research. Remember that there are different levels of trust verification. When you sign somebody's key, you can say, I've done casual or I've done very careful research into the information presented. Do your research, sign your keys appropriately, and don't automatically discount certain ideas for doing verification just because the how-to says it's bad or just because some guy at a key signing party says it's bad. So that's what I've got. Uh, if there are any other questions, well, we're going to be doing the key signing party right now, so I'll be around. Um, is there anything else before we finish? Uh, any other questions that people had? Policy links are great. Nobody uses them. That's a shame. That's all I got. <laughs> People should use them. Re read up on policy links and keep your websites accurate. Uh, it's, it's a good thing, but nobody uses them, unfortunately. Congratulations. Excellent. It se seems to me there is like several problems with this uh, signing stuff that you brought up. I've been using PGP for 10 years, and you brought up things I hadn't thought of. Uh, like when I sign someone's key, I would like to be also be able to know if I sign it because I saw his photo ID or because I know him or because I've met him several times and everyone thinks he's that identity, if I think it's a real name or a nick and stuff like that. But the, the keys doesn't contain that kind of information. At the HOPE key signing party, you said you've been using PGP for 10 years? Is your key 10 years old? Yeah, because I haven't had much use. Okay, well, so I'm not going to sign your key. No, because there, there, there I don't was a guy, use it anymore. There was a guy at the Hope Key Signing Party who said, well, your key, uh, it's one of my friends, that, the Miles guy that we mentioned before, his key was like something like eight years old, and somebody told him, your key's been around for eight years, you must have had some sort of server compromise with the machine that your key was on over the last eight years, your key's too old, I'm not going to sign it. Like, how do you make that arbitrary of a decision? So I'm not going to sign your key because it's 10 years old. Um, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I got nothing. Yes? Uh, I just wanted to add that probably the key is too short to be, to be used today anyway, if it's 10 years old. There were a lot of people back then who were like, I hacked my copy of PGP so I can use 10,000-bit keys. <laughs> Like, people were really proud of their 10,000 bit long keys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. But the, the key length is important. But uh, are there any other questions? Or are we done here? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>